He was a charismatic man with a gift of the gab. He spoke damn well when he addressed a public meeting. He could electrify the crowd. He would not sleep at State House because he said there were ghosts of white people and the frogs were cloaking. He thought they were saying he shouldn't be there. Kenyatta legacy left the country on the right track. The Kenyan capital, Nairobi, one of the fastest growing cities in Africa. The dynamic metropolis reflects the growth and progress happening across much of the continent. But though it's a city looking to the future, it is also one mindful of the past. And the man who helped shape Kenya into what it is today. It only remains for me to present to you, Mr. Prime Minister, these constitutional instruments which establish Kenya's independence. December the 12th, 1963, and Jomo Kenyatta, then in his early 70s, becomes the founding father of the Kenyan nation. He's down in history as the man who won his country independence. But to millions of Kenyans, then and now, is simply called Mze. When a man becomes older and older, particularly a wise man or a leader, he's a Mze. In fact, sometimes they even used to call him old man. To Europeans, that may sound very bad when somebody calls you old man, but not to Africans. It's a term of respect. In a presidency spanning 14 years, Kenyatta was an icon to his people, well known for his distinctive personal style. The leather jacket, I would say it was his political trademark. Every time there was national political celebration, he would come in that leather jacket. That was his symbol. And a very big ring, and very nice carved walking stick, and a fly whisk, of course. His fly whisk, for example, was a gift from Ethiopia, from Hel Selassie, the emperor. It's a sign of authority, it's a sign of peace. When you do that, you're telling people peace. Today, Kenya is thriving, as is Kenyatta's legacy. But nearly 50 years after independence, the country is a very different place to the one he grew up in. For first as a protectorate and later as a colony, Kenya was then ruled by the British. When the white people came, they decided to make the African a kind of a servant, the servant's class. And anybody who asked for independence is shot. It was not officially called apartheid in this country, it was called the color bar. And the color bar made white people citizens number one, Asians citizens number two, and the Africans were citizens number three. Men were given what they call kipande, identification card, which was put in a metal box, and then it was hung their heads so that it looks like a dog's tag. The young Jomo Kenyatta was among those unafraid to speak out against these injustices. Born in Gatondo, in Kenya's central highlands, his family was part of the Kikuyu community, 
the largest of Kenya's 40 or so ethnic groups. From the start, he showed resolve and initiative. He paid for himself to go to school by working as a houseboy for a white settler. In the 1920s, he entered politics and went to Britain to lobby for his country and further his education. Back in Kenya, his popularity grew and returning in 1946, he was a focus for the growing call for the British to get out. We must show the world that some of them have been wrong, that some of them have misunderstood us, and it's only by our action they will know that we mean business. A lot of people championed that cause, but the one person who brought that movement gave it the blood, the stamina, if you like, the strength that stretched across the country and made it a real nationalistic movement, was Jomo Kenyatta. He was a charismatic man with a gift of the gab. He spoke damn well when he addressed a public meeting. He could electrify the crowd. So it was natural that every Kenyan just loved him. The early 1950s saw the rise in Kenya of the Mau Mau, freedom fighters ready to use violence as a means to an end. In response, the British declared a state of emergency in which tens of thousands of Kenyans were detained or killed. In October 1952, Kenyatta, now in his 60s, was arrested and accused of managing the Mau Mau, a charge he always denied. He was sentenced to seven years hard labor. On his release from detention in 1961, his resolve and following were even stronger. Kenyatta was overwhelming as a speaker to his people. I remember once I saw uh, him speak about um, independence mainly for Kenya. And uh, of course this, uh, this was bad news for the settler who insisted that uh, Kenya will never be independent. When do you want independence for Kenya? Today. To the, to the settler, he was a devil. There's no question about that. He's Satan incarnate. But post-World War II, the British Empire was shrinking fast and, by the early 1960s, Britain was making plans to pull out. Kenyatta's party won elections in Kenya in 1963. He became prime minister and the path to independence was paved. This is one of the happiest days of my life. But while Kenyans were thrilled with their new leader, the British white settlers were less so. Everyone was shit scared, if I might say, of what was going to happen to their easy way of life. The white settlers requested a meeting with Kenyatta. That meeting took place in a hall in Nakuru. And the white settlers who were in Kenya that time, many of them were there. The hall was full. Dr. Njiroge Mungai, then in his 30s, was one of four government advisors Kenyatta took with him. Our advice at that time, this has never been told before, uh, was that we don't want these people to stay. We want them to go quickly. When you tell them, give some kind of notice for them to know that the land must go back to the people. He said, yes, yes, yes. So we went there and we sat down. Then President Kenyatta started talking. Well, we expected to hear this mention when they had to leave, but that's not what we heard. I think some of you have been maybe worried what will happen if Kenyatta comes to be the head of the government. Well, now, let me set you to rest. 
that Kenyatta had no intention whatsoever to look backward. We are going to forgive the past. That speech was a very good one. He says, stop, look, calm down, boys. I'm not going to slit your throat. If you behave yourselves and don't throw your weight around, there's a future for you here. That's not what we thought he was going to say. But it was, the meeting went off very well. And they asked any questions, he handled them beautifully. We admired him. But still, he didn't say something that we had asked him to say. So when we finished the meeting, we went back to the small room just to discuss with him. Well, Zay Kenyatta said, yes, I listened to you very carefully. I listened to your advice very well, but I did not accept your advice. If you look at it now, it was a very smart and a very wise way of doing it. We were men in a hurry, youth in a hurry, and we wanted to see them get out and get their notice. But he was much wiser than us. Tolerance and cooperation were the hallmarks of the new Kenyatta presidency. He coined the phrase Harambe, meaning let's pull together, and it became a national slogan. But though he'd invited the white settlers to make Kenya their home, he found it difficult to think of State House, previously the British seat of government, as his. He would not sleep at State House uh, because he said there were ghosts uh, of white people. He said that he couldn't sleep because there were ghosts of white people and the frogs were cloaking. He thought they were saying he shouldn't be there. From then on, every night, however late, Kenyatta made a 50-kilometer journey to Gatondo. As well as being his birthplace, it was now the location of the home he shared with his wife Ngina and their four children, Christine, Uhuru, Anna and Muhoho. Ngina was Kenyatta's fourth wife. He had four more children from earlier marriages, including one to a British woman while living in the UK. As a father and as a husband, he embraced traditional values. He liked his wife to look like a Kikuyu wife, not, 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 not too anglicized or westernized. Trousers at the time here were not worn by, have just very recently been taken over. They were going to go for the inauguration of the Air Force and Mama Gena, looking for the, to look best, wore trousers and the MZ did not like it. Oh yes, I think she changed, yeah. At heart, he was still a very sentimental Kikuyu uh, person and loved in the evening nothing more than to have dozens of women chanting away in their tribal songs uh, night after night after night. He loved that sort of thing. When it came to his country, however, Kenyatta was modern and progressive. Under his leadership, the infrastructure grew and the economy prospered. As soon as independence came and Kenyatta government was formed, I think it as if the whole world was waiting for it. A lot of investors moved in. The economy was very, very lively. I think his leadership really spearheaded the economic development. In building this new nation, Kenyatta had an overriding priority. Number one for Kenyatta was education. He regarded its education as a very important instrument in the uh, governance of the, of, the, of the country. Successful education system was very important to him. In 1966, the Jomo Kenyatta Foundation was set up. Its mandate to use proceeds from the sale of textbooks to pay for deprived children to go to school continues to this day. 
Nervous. Nervous come and demonstrate to us how to construct a perpendicular bisector of the line AB. You first construct a line. Thanks to the foundation, 15-year-old Nelia Songare is now studying at a girls' boarding school in Nairobi. Her ambition is to become a chemical engineer. You make another suspended arc over here. Without the scholarship, she'd have little chance of achieving her dream. For her mother is a single parent and her home is one of the city's biggest slums. The Jomo Kenyatta Foundation has so far educated approximately uh, 15,000 Kenyan needy and bright students in the Kenyan public secondary schools at an approximated cost of six and a quarter million dollars. The students are poor orphans, destitutes from all over the country. We also cater for the disabilities. I think if it are not for the Jomo Kenyatta Foundation sponsorship, I don't think that I could first have gone to secondary school. Maybe I could just have been left in the village looming like some of my friends there because my mother could not have afforded the fees to take me to a secondary school. I think that the Mokinyata Foundation sponsorship have helped me a lot. As well as nurturing his new nation, Kenyatta was successful in forging links abroad. During the years following independence, he regularly played host to visiting dignitaries and heads of states. Prince Charles, Princess Anne came here and they wanted to see him at home. I was foreign minister then, so I took them to Gatondo, his home. And they sat there in an African setting, all of them being very comfortable, talking, laughing about their own country, about this country, and they also felt quite happy. He was able to adjust to anybody. He had a, a wonderful sense of humor. Outside the public arena, if you met him in private, he was full of jokes. He had he had very good sense of humor. He made people laugh and uh, his memory was just wonderful. On other occasions, however, Kenyatta could show a different side. He had a terrible temper sometimes. I remember once Jomo Kenyatta, he had called the Baluhia people to talk to them about fighting in their area. They were they, they have been burning of houses and uh, Jomo said, look, I'm not going to send the police to find out who it is. It's one of you. Uh, but one of the people said, uh, try to justify the situation. And they used uh, some words that were very unpleasant to Jomo Kenya. So he threw uh, that fly whisk to him. As the years progressed, it's claimed, Kenyatta became increasingly intolerant of dissent. He had the Kenyan constitution amended to extend his powers. In the euphoria of independence, politicians of different backgrounds and beliefs had joined together. But within a few years, factions were forming, and Oginga Odinga, once Kenyatta's ally and vice president, set up an opposition party. Rivalries came to a head when in 1969 both men turned up at the opening of Kisumu Hospital in western Kenya. The crowd, mainly Odinga supporters and members of his ethnic group, the Luo, began heckling Kenyatta. A scuffle broke out in which on the main dais of these uh, VIPs somebody threw a chair in Kenyatta's direction. Well, Kenyatta obviously was very well prepared and so were his people for trouble. And trouble then began in a serious way. There was an awful lot of shoving and pushing. There was a lot of noise that was being made. And uh, the voices were drowned. And of course, it was the duty of the police to protect and keep peace. The bodyguard of Kenyatta surrounded him, 
and started firing outwards in a general kind of way. It was terrifying. The main crowd were about 100 meters away and they started shouting anti-Kenyatta slogans. And Kenyatta somehow managed to get the microphone back and started to insult in a very salty way the Luo people in general. And on the VIP stand still, Odinga kept shouting back at Kenyatta. So it was a very, very explosive situation. At least 10 people died in the shooting. Just days later, Odinga's political party was banned, turning Kenya effectively into a one-party state, and Odinga himself was arrested and detained. Kenyatta, by now, was nearing the end of his second presidential term and approaching 80. Because the constitution had been changed so much, it gave Kenyatta the powers to detain without trial. And that showed clearly what kind of a despot he had become, an intolerant uh, despot who could not tolerate any form of opposition. Land issues also proved controversial and remain so to this day. They were cited as factors in violence in Kenya following elections in December 2007. What happened in 2008 was not so much a question of election. It was a land question. Election was just a trigger. Every time there's such a thing, it triggers that, that anger. Any spark can cause a, a conflagration. To blame, some believe, were corruption and ethnic bias in the resettlement of land previously held by the British. I have to admit that the, the, the exercise was not as straightforward, it was not as successful, it was not as good as it should have been. Because if it had, I think we would have solved the, the problem which is still uh, with us. Instead of really doing it uh, in a straightforward manner, they were, they were a bit crooked. Kenyatta's personal acquisition of large tracts of land is also a source of national debate. But other events cast, perhaps, a darker shadow. In July 1969, Tom Boyer, a politician tipped by some as a contender for the presidency, was gunned down in Nairobi city centre. His death came four years after journalist and politician Pio Gama Pinto, an opponent of Kenyatta's government, was shot at close range. And in 1975, Josiah Mwangi Karioki, another politician who challenged the regime, was also assassinated. I would like to exonerate Jomo Kenyatta himself from being instrumental in the assassination of Tom Boyer, uh, Pio Gama Pinto, and uh, J.M. Karaoke. I don't think Jomo Kenyatta was instrumental. Jomo Kenyatta was getting old. He was not even really running the show. By the time of his death, he, he was just a respected old man his health towards the end, about the last four or five years, was not, was not good. Because sometimes he could not fulfill his official duties, although he made every attempt to come out of... Sometimes he just stayed at Gatondo, or went to Mombasa, and we would not disclose the reason. Sometimes he could not walk properly, and sometimes he couldn't read properly, and sometimes he couldn't think properly. A few people around Kenyatta took advantage 
of his senility. And uh, given that he was the president, and a very active president as such, everything must receive his um, uh, stamping, they used to make him stamp things that were not really properly done. A few of his own people around him. And that, I think, was unfortunate. In August 1978, now in his late 80s, Kenyatta invited his entire family to a reunion at his house on the Kenyan coast. A week and a day later, he died in his sleep. Despite Kenyatta's advanced years, the nation he'd founded was stunned. People cry, people are upset. You know, we embalmed him, and no, he, so he was lying in state house. And I mean, just like him, in his suit and uh, flower, which Mama Gena used to put every morning, a new, a new flower. And people could not accept that Muse has gone. Jomo Kenyatta's legacy was, or still is, that Africans in Kenya could rule themselves. He broke the colonial legacy. He persuaded people that they could rule themselves. And those who are in doubt, he ruled them and showed he could rule them with justice and they could develop into a new country. Today, we have a lot of doctors around. Today, we have a lot of engineers. Lawyers, you don't have to count them. There are so many. Eh? And all that in a relatively short time of less than 40 years. Kenyatta legacy left the country on the right track. He left a very good foundation. It keeps Kenya going even today. Otherwise, there are occasions that have come. If there was not a firm foundation like that, Kenya could have disintegrated. It has not, and it is not going to, because of that good, firm, strong foundation that the father of this nation created. When he allowed tribalism to get out of control, and when he allowed corruption to get out of control, the old man was getting older and probably not in full control of his mind. Because the Jomo Kenyatta, who was free, independent, thinking Jomo Kenyatta, was willing to sacrifice himself for the sake of this country. And I think we should remember him as a great man.